Summertime in Japan is beer time. Hot, humid weather contributed to Japan's unique take on beer. In Japan, beer is often served ice cold in a frosty mug. The Japanese like beer that really hits the spot as you gulp it down. Beer came to Japan from the Netherlands in the 18th century. As the country modernized, it gradually put down roots in Japanese life. During Japan's post-war economic boom years, beer became the after-work drink of choice for salarymen, the corporate warriors who supported Japan's growth. Beer consumption skyrocketed. But in recent years, the impact of a long recession and a move away from beer by young people has led to a drop in consumption. Brewers are trying to engineer a revival in the drink's popularity. One innovation is an attempt to recreate the first made in Japan strain of malting barley and use it to produce craft beer. On this edition of Begin Japanology, our theme is beer. We'll explore how the Japanese climate nurtured a unique drink that became the favorite of millions. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in a beer garden on the roof of a department store in Tokyo, which is typically where you'll find these kind of beer gardens. This one's in the Shibuya district of Tokyo, just down the road from NHK. When it gets hot and humid in the summer in Japan, a lot of people will stop off at a beer garden on their way home from work for a few beers, which seems like an eminently good idea to me. I'm going to try some too. Thank you. OK, let's get stuck in. OK, let's start off with a look at what it is that makes Japanese beer Japanese. Cheers. Picnicking under blooming cherry blossoms is a Japanese tradition. Every spring, Ueno Park in Tokyo welcomes thousands of beer-drinking picnickers. Beer is also a fixture at pro baseball games. Call out an order to a vendor walking around the stands and she'll pour you a beer from a special backpack cake. Downing a beer watching baseball out in the open makes it taste all the better. Outstanding. This atmosphere makes a big difference. At the end of a long day, colleagues often grab a drink at a nearby izakaya, Japanese-style pub. And the first round is nearly always beer. When you down it, you get this... this great tingle in the throat. Love it. It's got that great sensation going down the throat. When ordering, got to start with a beer, is an extremely common phrase. That tells you how much the Japanese love their beer. Here's the alcoholic drink section at a supermarket. Many different beers are displayed. About six million kiloliters of beer and beer-flavored beverages are sold per year in Japan. They account for close to 70% of the alcoholic drinks that Japan consumes. Most of the beer drunk in Japan is a kind of lager. Beers generally fall into two main styles according to how they're brewed, lagers and ales. Ales are fermented at higher temperatures than lagers. In places like Britain and Belgium, a lot of drinkers like ales for their full body and fruitiness. To highlight those features, ales are served chilled only slightly, or not at all, and drinkers sip them to enjoy their flavor. But in Japan, people usually drink lager. It's fermented at a lower temperature than ale and has a simple, refreshing taste. This beer is for gulping down, and the colder it is, the better. In Japan's humid summers, a frosty lager is just the ticket. As Japanese beer makers came to see the first gulp as the key point, they specialized in lagers. And a beer garden is the perfect place to enjoy Japanese-style beer. 
In the summer, beer gardens open up on top of tall city buildings. They're great places to forget your cares. There are even beer gardens far from city centers. This one is at an elevation of 500 meters near the summit of Mount Takao in Hachioji, West Tokyo. Each year, huge numbers of people make the trek here. More than an hour by train and cable car from central Tokyo. This place in Kyoto is actually a rehearsal space for geisha, but it opens as a beer garden during the summer. Beer drinkers can enjoy the unusual experience of being served by geisha in an informal atmosphere. Isn't this just perfect? Recently, there's been a fad for beer that offers the ultimate bracing refreshment. These people are queuing up to drink beer that's been chilled to minus two degrees Celsius, just above freezing point. I enjoyed that two degrees below zero sensation. Beer in Japan has developed to cope with the dog days of summer because the Japanese have found that one of the best ways to deal with the sweltering heat is simply to grin and beer it. Japanese people have a thing about really cold beer, and I'm told that this establishment has a particularly cold beer on the menu. And I've got a suspicion that there's one on its way. There you are. There we go. Thank you. Wow, look at the head on that. Oh, please take a seat. I'd like oh, to thank you. Now, what is this? This is draft beer capped with frozen foam. The head is actually crushed frozen beer. It's got special texture. Ah, okay, well, let me have a try. Mm. Oh my God, that's like, um, it's like soft ice cream or something. Yes, exactly. That's, what, let me, this one. Mm. Mm. Ah. You know when you have ice cream and it makes the top of your brain go, it's a little bit like that. What do you think it is that makes these kind of beer guards so popular in Japan? Japanese love drinking beer outside. They love drinking outside in general. Japan has distinct seasons. In winter, we drink sake looking at the snow. In spring, we drink under the cherry blossoms looking at the flowers. And summer is the time for open air beer gardens. It's a great way to enjoy the seasons. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, beer took off in Japan in a big way in the days of the post-war economic boom. It was the heyday of the corporate warrior, and the number of beer halls and beer gardens skyrocketed during that time. Let's go back now and take a look at the history of beer in Japan. Between the 17th and mid-19th centuries, Japan restricted trade with the West. Only the Dutch were allowed to trade, and they introduced beer. This is a report by an official of the Shogun who dined with the Dutch. He tried beer and didn't like it at all. Then in 1853, Kawamoto Komin, a scholar of Western learning, became the first person to try brewing beer in Japan. It's said that he built a brewing apparatus in his garden, referring to Dutch documents. A maker of alcoholic drinks in Kawamoto's home prefecture, Hyogo, recently revived that beer, using Kawamoto's original brewing method. Mmm, tastes good. Did it really taste this good back then? In 1870, not long after Japan opened to trade, the first full-scale brewery was built in the foreign quarter of Yokohama. It was established by William Copeland, an American engineer. His target customers were foreigners, but he also won over Japanese who were curious about new things from the West. Later, the Japanese government started studying the possibility of brewing beer. In those days, Hokkaido was Japan's frontier region. In 1876, a state-owned brewery was established there. The following year, it began shipping beer to Tokyo. After that, brewing companies began springing up in quick succession. At the dawn of the Japanese beer industry, there were roughly 100 competing breweries. In the cities, lifestyles, clothing, food, living spaces, 
were becoming more westernized and beer consumption gradually spread. But in those days, beer was still for the fashionable elite. It wasn't something that anyone could drink regularly. In the 1960s, however, as the Japanese economy began to soar, beer finally came to the masses. Consumption exploded, and the key factor was the increasingly widespread ownership of refrigerators. Now able to drink beer chilled at home, many people began enjoying beer in the evening. When the workers who powered the economy wanted to unwind, beer was the drink of choice. It became a part of everyday life. But after peaking in 1994, beer consumption started to decline after the economic bubble burst and with the young drinking less heavily. Beer companies responded by developing low-priced alternatives, which included low malt beer and beer-like beverages. Japan's tax laws impose lower taxes on beverages with lower malt content. By using ingredients other than barley, and thus holding down the malt content, brewers are able to avoid higher taxes and sell at lower prices. And recently, non-alcohol beer has grown in popularity. It was originally developed to prevent drunk driving. But another reason for its recent rapid growth is its popularity with other careful drinkers, including expecting mothers. I can't drink alcohol because I'm breastfeeding. But when everyone around me is drinking, I feel left out and I hate it. And so I drink this instead. <laughs> there has also been a boom in craft beer brewing around Japan. A change in the law in 1994 eased restrictions on the minimum scale of brewing facilities. This led to the nationwide production of many ale-type beers, which are easier to brew than lagers. Countless beers appeared featuring famous local ingredients, such as fruit. This brought a sea change to the beer industry, which had previously offered lagers that all tasted pretty much the same. This one is a strawberry beer. It's sweet. It tastes different from the beer I usually drink. It's nice to try all these new kinds. This place used to be a brewery. It belongs to a beer company that was established in 1887. It's now been turned into a museum and has exhibits relating to the history of beer. Let's take a look. Hello. Thank you for coming. You're going to be my guide for today. I am. Please take a look here. This gives you an idea of how much a large bottle of beer would have cost around the year 1900. One bowl of soba noodles cost two sen, while the bottle of beer cost 20 sen. So you could have 10 bowls of noodles for this one bottle. In today's money, that would be about 3,000 or 4,000 yen, quite expensive. Now, take a look at this photo. Mm. Beer hall. Hi. Oh. It's Japan's first beer hall. 1899, wow. At the time, there were really no other places that had this feeling of a Western beer hall. The people of Tokyo just loved it. And this was the first snack served in the beer hall to go with the beer. It was sliced daikon radish. Do you know if it was popular with the customers? Actually, it seems that it wasn't at all. <laughs> OK, now for the good bit. So, lead me on. I'm going to show you a special way to pour a beer. I'm all ears. First, with the glass standing straight up like this, pour the beer from as high up as you can. OK. When the glass is a bit more than half full, stop. Very well done. <laughs> By allowing it to foam, you let some carbonation escape from the liquid. And with this pouring method, your beer tastes like it came right out of the tap. Okay. 
So now you pour a second time, this time from a bit lower, all the way up to the lip of the glass, and pour slowly. OK. Finally, you pour slowly and gently so that you lift up the foam. All right. Pour until the foam rises up about one centimeter above the lip of the glass. Don't stop until then. So, do I actually get to drink some now? Please, go ahead. Mm. That is nice, actually. The balance between the foam and the beer is great. I think I probably have a white moustache. Thank you very much. Excellent. About 110 years ago, during a boom time for beer brewers, Japan's first malting barley was born. It disappeared from the market once, but is now being revived. Let's take a look. Nerima Ward in Tokyo is mainly residential. But tucked away, there is this barley field. Growing in this field is a strain of barley called Kamiko Golden. It was the first malting barley developed in Japan. Nearby is a monument identifying this as the birthplace of Japanese malting barley. The barley was developed in 1900 by a local farmer named Ushigoro Kaneko. He crossed a Japanese barley strain with an American malting barley. This barley's characteristic is a short stalk that can't be easily knocked down. It was easy to cultivate, and at one point it was being grown all around Tokyo and its neighboring prefectures. Later, many new and improved barleys were bred from Kaneko Golden. It made a major contribution to Japanese beer making. But in the 1950s, competition from imported barley led to a halt in the cultivation of Kaneko Golden. However, Nerim Award and the local agricultural co-op recently turned to Kaneko Golden to create a new local speciality beer. They obtained preserved seeds and began trial planting in 2003. The crop is grown with the help of local farmers and harvested each year around June. When the stalks have bent over this much, it means they're getting dry. And that's a sign that it's time to harvest. Currently, seven farms are raising this crop. About 10,000 square meters are under cultivation. Bringing back a strain of barley from the old days is a reminder. We're hoping that it will remind the local people that this area has a farming heritage and that it's something we should value. The harvested barley goes to a brewery elsewhere in Tokyo, where it is turned into beer. First the barley is malted, then squeezed to make wort. Yeast is added, and the mixture ferments in tanks for roughly two weeks. Then it is bottled, and after a month or so of in-bottle fermentation, it's ready to drink. It has a nice bitterness, but also the sweetness of barley, nicely balanced. Beer brewed from 100% Kaneko Golden is mild, not too bitter. The beer has a fruity aroma reminiscent of apples and natural barley sweetness. It's mellower on the tongue. That's the impression you get. And that's what sets it apart from normal barley. The beer is sold at farmers' markets in Nerima Ward and some other places as well. About 15,000 bottles are produced each year, and they're all sold. A craft beer from the heart of Tokyo. There are hopes it will become a big hit and the pride of the community. Well, here I am in that field of Kaneko golden barley that you saw in the video. And as you can see, it's turned a beautiful golden color now, just ready to be harvested. And I'm joined now by Mr. Kazuyoshi Watanabe, who's been a central part of this project. 
Hello, nice to meet Hello. you. And I see you have something <laughs> very welcoming looking. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you very much. That looks great, doesn't it? And it's got a kind of cloudy Hi. feel to it there. That's, is that a little unusual? Yes, uh, Kaneko Golden is an old variety of barley. It has a lot of protein. That's what gives it that whitish cloudiness. But that's one reason major beer makers stopped using this kind of barley. Ah. Okay, let me just try some. Ah, go ahead. Mmm. It's, it's really tasty and not too heavily chilled, too. I think for, for the average Englishman, this is the sort of beer that a lot of people will like. Very nice indeed. Why is it important to have agricultural land in a place like this? Well, in places without parks or grassland, in places without open spaces, agricultural land like this can serve as an evacuation zone in the event of an emergency. People are realizing that agricultural land in big cities can actually serve a lot of functions. And, of course, there's something about the atmosphere, the scenery, that's just good for the soul. There are educational benefits as well. We think agricultural land brings all kinds of good effects. And you also reap the benefit of having a very nice craft beer as well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Well, craft beers like this are now becoming popular and are being brewed all over Japan. We're going to meet a woman now whose beers have been winning wards. Sakura, a city in Chiba, 30 kilometers east of Tokyo. There's a woman here who is passionate about craft beer brewing. Momoyo Kagitani has been making beer for 15 years. She has won seven gold medals in Japan's biggest craft beer contest. The beer I make is not just a product, it's a part of me. 30 breweries from across Japan take part in this craft beer event. Visitors are clustering around one booth. They want Kagitani's Kolsch beer. It's not too light. It has plenty of body, but it's clean. Very refreshing. Perfect for a summer evening. Just perfect. <laughs> After finishing high school, Kagitani took a job with a company selling alcoholic drinks. Before long, the company launched a craft beer venture. Kagitani eagerly volunteered to work on it, but the brewing operation needed to be built from scratch. By training at leading beer makers, she gradually acquired the know-how. Then one day, she encountered a beer with a flavor that struck her as perfect. Kolsch, from Cologne in Germany. It had an aroma more like wine than beer. Discovering a beer like that really opened my eyes to new possibilities. She wanted to create a beer that women would like. Through trial and error, she finally perfected the beer that she had in mind. It won a gold medal at an event where 60 beer makers were competing. Kagitani was just 24 at the time. It was a shock to win. I had entered contests before, but never came close to winning. It took a while before the shock turned to happiness. Just as she was starting to get the hang of beer making, she met Koichi, the man who is now her husband. Koichi was a big fan of craft beers who came to her brewery for a tour. They hit it off immediately. They married in 2002. Now Kagitani had to balance work with family life. In 2007, Kagitani's daughter Marika was born. Kagitani returned to work after a year of maternity leave. She had to breastfeed her daughter, but she also had to taste the beer she was making. Naturally, it was something I was a little worried about. I wanted to make sure it wouldn't affect her. 
so I would do tastings after breastfeeding her if necessary. She would drop her daughter off at childcare in the morning and pick her up after work each day. She wasn't able to completely immerse herself in beer making as she had before. Two years later, she became pregnant with her second child. Kagitani was in sole charge of beer making at her company. While she was on maternity leave, they had to suspend operations. I felt really sorry that we couldn't ship out the orders we received. I wanted to keep the factory in operation as much as possible. The husband, Koichi, came to the rescue. He fully supported her career, and in 2010, when their son was born, Koichi took as much leave as he could so that he could take care of the children. With the help of her husband, Kagitani was able to devote herself even more single-mindedly to beer making. Looks lovely. Then, in 2011, she received her seventh award in the craft beer contest, a new record for the competition. That year, her brewery was also honored with a Brewery of the Year award. Having children changed things. Actually, it made me feel more passionate about things. It made me feel like trying new things. Kagitani continues to balance work and family as she pursues her quest to brew great tasting beer. Having grown up in an ale drinking country, I've always found Japanese beer a little bit too fizzy and a little bit too cold. On the other hand, today I've learned how to pour it properly. I also had a chance to try out that wonderful craft beer. That really was excellent. If you're planning a visit to Japan, I definitely recommend that one. I'll see you again next time. From plastic rubbers to decorative masking tape, Japan's astounding range of stationary items is stunning the world with its attention to detail and ingenious creativity.